Amen. It is time to begin. I'm thankful for all of you that have joined us tonight, either here in the sanctuary or online. I think we get a good Bible study. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm real partial to Bible study. Amen. So uh, I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord gives us an opportunity to dig deep tonight into his word. Amen. Well, a couple of things that I want to make you aware of as we uh, move towards the, the next few weeks and months. We've got a youth ministry event coming up on Friday, uh, the Glow Game. So if you know of any teenagers that are running around out there, you are welcome to invite them. I believe it starts at 9 o'clock, and um, I think it's going to be a great time for the kids. So uh, make a note of that. If you have any neighbors, if you have any kin folks, if you have any enemies, no kids at McDonald's waiting on you, say, hey, you want to have some fun on Friday night? They're really doing it as an outreach event, so uh, we're, we're believing God for a good turnout, amen? Um, please pray for Pastor Rick and Miss Joyce, as Miss Joyce's father passed away um, yesterday. It was yesterday, yes. Boy, it seems like everything has run together on me. He passed away yesterday. Doyle was 92 years old, and he was ready to meet the Lord, and... Uh, these last few years had been very difficult for him as far as health is concerned, and so it was a blessing, but obviously that's Joyce's dad and Bev's dad and uh, Daryl's dad, and so, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult for them to, you know, say goodbye, but it's going to be a, you know, they, they're just, they're just like ahead of us by a little ways, I feel like anyway, so uh, pray for that family. Uh, there's going to be a lot of folks traveling that direction for the funeral. Not exactly sure when it's going to be, but pray for, you know, their travel, that it'd be safe. And a lot of them are going to be flying on airplanes. And this coronavirus thing is just not a good thing to fly on airplanes with. Amen. So we'll pray for them. And uh, any other prayer requests tonight that any of y'all have? Miss Helen? Amen. I pray for Claudia. She's on my heart a lot, so amen. Anybody else? Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us tonight, Lord. We pray with this word that we are about to jump into. Father, we pray through the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God, Lord, that you will get it into us, Father. I pray, Lord, as we methodically work our way through this word, Lord, that you will illuminate it, Father, through the power of your Spirit to our, to our minds and to our hearts. That, Father, we would absorb it, Lord, and I pray, Father, that it will ultimately change us to bring us into conformity with your Son. Father, we pray over Claudia today, Lord. Father, you know where she's at, Father. You've got her address, Lord, and I know that you are working diligently, Lord God, to bring her, Father, through the steps, Lord, that she needs to take, Father, to bring her life into conformity with yours, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would just minister to her, her husband, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you would just... Get a hold of her, Lord God, as you have done so many in the past, Lord. And Father, we just commit her into your hands. We pray for Pastor Rick and Miss Joyce, Lord, the whole family, Father, as they have, uh, uh, they have suffered a loss, Lord. I know that you have prepared their hearts, Lord. And as your word tells us that we don't grieve as others grieve, Father, that have no hope. Because indeed, we have hope, Father. We know that Doyle was ready to meet you. And I know, Father, that he was looking forward to that day that he would step into your presence. We don't pray for Doyle, Lord God, because we know he is okay. But, Father, we pray for the family, Lord God, as they uh, say their goodbyes, Lord God, as they uh, move through the process, Lord God, of grieving. Father, we pray over those that will be traveling. And we ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, just to put your hand upon each and every one of them. Keep them safe, Father God. Bring them back to their homes, Father, safely. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've got a song tonight. So uh, are you ready? Amen. Well, you just stand up.
Amen. That's a good word. Amen. Ain't that the truth? Amen. Amen. Good. Thank you for that. Well, folks, let's jump into this. Uh, we're going to try to cover a few verses tonight. Uh, this, we're going to start with verse number 19 tonight, but a couple of things before we get into the text. Um, you know, last week we talked about how that Paul experienced joy through the ministry, the ministry that God had anointed him to, to bring to this planet, if you would. He had joy from that ministry. Amen. I imagine that probably there's some people in here that do various things that brings joy to you. Amen. I love to garden. I just, that's just something that I don't know where I got that from, but I love to plant gardens, raise gardens. Last year, I decided because it just, it sometimes gardens can be overwhelming. I decided not to have a garden. And so I didn't plant one. And I'm telling you the whole summer, I was like going, man, I wish I'd have planted a garden. I wish I would have planted a garden because I get joy from that. Amen. Many of you can probably identify with something that brings you joy. Uh, you know, working on cars, uh, building fancy engines and <laughs> doing all kinds of things. Uh, golfing brings you joy. Woodwork brings you joy. All of us have all those things that you know, we, we, we hold on to, that in them we find joy. The Apostle Paul got joy from doing the ministry that God had called him to. Last week we talked about things that were trying to dampen that joy, if you were. Last week we talked about him and the troubles that he was walking through at the time he wrote this letter, which was he was imprisoned. Uh, so that prison sentence did not affect his joy. Amen? He had joy in spite of that situation. Last week, we talked about people that, that were his detractors. All of those individuals that were out there saying bad things about Paul. They were, uh, you know, they were saying bad things about Paul. Amen. And, uh, you know, even that did not quench his joy. Amen. So today, we're going to go on with a couple more of those things through the text that we're getting into, this joy that he had. There was nothing that could cause him to lose his joy. Not trouble, not detractors. And these next two, death and the flesh, are these next two that we're going to talk about. Um, despite all the trials, despite all the sufferings, despite all the sorrows that the Apostle Paul experienced, uh, there was nothing that could cause his joy to go away. Let me just read you out of 2 Corinthians 11, 23 uh, through 33. <clears throat> Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who, who, who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who was blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the, the, the ethnarch under that king was guarding the city of Damascus, or D Damascenes, in order to seize me, and I was let down in a basket through the window, the walls, and so escaped in his hands. So this is just a quick list, if you would, of all the things that the Apostle Paul went through. Like I said, the sorrows, the troubles, the, the sufferings that the Apostle Paul experienced. There was none of these things that could ultimately quench his joy. Now, I don't believe that he was probably giggling in the middle of those 39 lashes that he took the various times on his back, beaten with rods, uh, uh, stoned. I don't think he was giggling with that. But through it all, I mean, even whenever we see he was beaten and thrown into prison with, uh, with Silas, 
you know, the joy broke out in the middle of the night and he started singing hymns. His ministry, even though he experienced all of these things, his, his ministry experience brought him joy. Um, these next few verses that we're going to get into, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, four issues that might have brought him trouble. My, excuse me, might have robbed him of his joy. The first one we talked about last week, which is trouble. Second one, detractors. The third one is death. The fourth one is the flesh. So as I said, these first two issues, we've covered them already. Um, but he reveals that both the impending threat of death, because he, he, was in a, he was really in a bind. I mean, they could have literally just said, cut his head off, and they would have. Uh, and the sorrows of living in the flesh. Now, just I'm going to do this later a couple of times, but it's not the same flesh maybe that you think of a lot of times. The flesh is a sinful flesh. The Apostle Paul is just talking about living in the natural, living, living in the flesh here instead of living in the Spirit in heaven. Amen? So let's jump into this. This is Philippians uh, 1, uh, 19 through 21. He says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Man, do you know how many scriptures that we quote out of the book of Philippians? Amen? So that's one of them right there. So in spite of death, I'm okay with that. As long as the word is glorified, as long as Jesus is glorified, even with death. So last week we learned that it really didn't make the, the Apostle Paul any difference if he was imprisoned or maligned by his uh, uh, detractors or facing possible execution, as long as what? The gospel of Jesus Christ was preached. Man, he said, man, it doesn't matter to me if they're preaching it out of uh, a good heart or a bad heart, as long as it's being preached. That's really all that really matters to me. So Philippians 1.18 says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. Amen? So he was fully confident that despite these crazy circumstances that he was living in the, in, in the midst of, that Jesus Christ, his Lord, would cause him to triumph. I mean, you know, if we could walk around with that kind of attitude all the time, no matter what I'm in, God's going to cause me to triumph. I'm going to win. No matter what comes my way, no matter what circumstances that I might be living in, God is going to cause me to triumph. That's what Paul thought. That's, that's what he preached. So whenever he starts to face death, I mean, if you're in prison, how many of you all know that the legal system in the Roman Empire, they killed a lot of people? Amen? I mean, they killed a lot of people for doing things that you and I would never think people get killed from. Do you all remember the two people that were hanging on either side of Jesus? Do you remember what they did? They were thieves. They were just thieves. They were probably petty criminals that literally they were executed for their crimes. Um, history tells us that up and down the roads coming into many of the Roman cities, you would see people who had been executed very often hanging beside the road for various crimes that they committed. And they didn't have to create, uh, commit some kind of heinous crime. Uh, most of them were very petty crimes compared to what we would execute somebody for today in the United States. So no matter what kind of ne negative situations that he might have been in, the Apostle Paul knew that the Lord was going to cause him to triumph so he could face death without any kind of fear. Uh, in these verses that I just read, he mentions five realities on which conf this confidence that he has is based. So the first thing that he mentions is this. He is confident in the precepts, or he's confident in the word of the Lord. This is what he says, for I know, listen to this, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. So the Apostle Paul, he's saying, man, I'm 
I'm, I'm sure that the, whenever you go back to the Greek, it means that you know something with certainty. Amen? Because a lot of times we say, I know. Uh, I know this, I know that. But, you know, every once in a while we say something that we really, really know. Amen? Does that make sense? Because I think we use the word know a little bit sometimes in the, in the wrong way. But the Apostle Paul here he uses a word in the Greek that means he knows something with certainty. Paul was absolutely convinced that his present suffering at the hands of both unbelievers and believers would turn out for his deliverance. Amen? How many of you all know that there's probably many ways that God can deliver you from the situation? Amen? Many ways. I can remember praying earnestly for folks that God would heal them. Various things was happening in their physical bodies, and uh, um, I've seen God do miracles. But I've also seen people that have passed away and gone on to be with Jesus. And, you know, you go, man, you know, what, what is this? Uh, God can deliver us. Well, as Michelle said this morning, he's a sovereign God. And, you know, his ways, we don't understand them all. But God has different ways of delivering. And so he says, I know this. I'm convinced that this suffering that I'm in, it is going to turn out for my deliverance. He actually quotes a scripture there from the Old Testament. This is Job talking to Zophar. And this is what it says in Job 13, 16. This also will be my salvation. Same context there. Uh, Paul uses uh, deliverance, but... Uh, Job uses salvation. So Job understood that the sufferings that he was in, and how many of y'all know that Job was suffering in a, in a degree that I, don't even, I can't even put my mind around. He knew that it was not God's punishment for sin. Job was a righteous man. Uh, Paul, just like Job, fully believed that one day God was going to deliver him. So he can say it with confidence. He says, guys, I'm going to tell you something. This is going to turn out for my deliverance. This, this is definitely going to happen. So he's very confident with that. You know, Paul, man, what was it? Romans 8, 28. You guys remember that one? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. This is a place right here where he's applying what he preaches. Amen? He's, he's saying, guys, this, this, this marvelous truth, I'm applying it to my own life. He knew that his conscience was clear. He knew that uh, he wasn't being, you know, divinely chast, uh, uh, chastened by a, a loving God, but he was fully convinced that God would cause the present suffering that he was in the midst of to work together for his good. For I know. I mean, man, you know, Paul says that, and he knows it. I was uh, told this story a couple of times. I'm sure many of you have heard it, but maybe one in here hasn't. I was working with a man one time that we were doing a um, kind of a crusade, and we had been praying for a night of healing. You know, people come and people would be prayed for. And uh, anyway, the gentleman that I was working with, uh, he was on the platform. And the service was starting, and he said, tonight, there are going to be signs and wonders at these altars. People are going to be healed. And I was looking at him. I was kind of looking right at his eyes. I mean, I was up close to him, and, and I'm just going to tell you, he believed what he was saying. He believed it. I mean, he, he knew it. He knew it. And that night, there were people who were healed. An individual that had been deaf since he was like a year and a half old, and he was probably almost 40, he came to the altar, and God literally opened his ears. He, he did not know how to speak because he had never learned English, and God also gave him English. You know, it's crazy. I mean, and other miracles took place, but I was watching him, and whenever he said it, he believed it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he believed it. That's Paul. He said, for this, I know. I know this one. Deliverance, the apostle Paul talks about here. Deliverance is from the Greek word, as I said a moment ago, 
Oftentimes, it translates salvation. A lot of commentators uh, out there believe that this was referring to the Apostle Paul's deliverance from sin, the Apostle Paul's deliverance from death from that sin. So in other words, this was deliverance through the blood of Jesus Christ. I've I've been delivered from death and sin. Amen. Anybody that's born again can claim that. Some people believe that's what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Um, And that idea, you know, certainly he could have been confident with his eternal security. You know, I'm saved. I'm, I'm going to heaven. But there are others that this deliverance refers to his vindication from Caesar. Because Caesar's the guy that had a hold of him. Y'all understand that? And I mean, Caesar at any time could have said, off with his head, and he would be off with his head. So, you know, there's people that actually think that that might be the case, that he's talking about his deliverance from uh, Caesar. However, I don't think he was talking about execution because he qualifies the expectation that he has with, and we'll get to it here in a few minutes, but he says, whether by life or by death, I'm going to be delivered. Okay, so in any case, Paul knew that his circumstances that he was in right there at that moment, that they were only temporary. For I know this. I know that my circumstances are only temporary. Uh, One way or another, the Apostle Paul knows, either by life or death, that he was going to be delivered from the circumstances that he was in. So... He's confident in the word of God, but he's also confident in this next thing, which is the prayers of the saints. How many of you all realize the power of prayers of the saints? I don't. I wish I did, but I know they're important. Amen. Because I am one that is a recipient of the prayers of the saints. I have folks that pray for me on a daily basis. And I can tell you there are days where I feel the power of those prayers. I feel it. There are days that I could not get through unless I had the power of those prayers propping me up. So the Apostle Paul says here, through your prayers, not only through the word, but now it's through your prayers. Paul believed in the limitless sovereignty of God. And he took that confidence and he took God's word and he knew that through the prayers of, of, through prayers, period, not just his, not just people around him, but he knew that, that the purpose of his life would ultimately be carried out. So he also knew that God's sovereign plan incorporates prayers. We have to pray for one another. I don't think we realize how important it is to pray for one another. I, I can tell you, I don't believe we really understand how important it is to pray for your spiritual leaders. Um, Years ago, some of you probably remember this and some of you probably don't, I moved to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and uh, a whole series of things uh, went in the Assemblies of God. Um, Tammy Faye Baker and Jim Baker and the PTL thing just exploded. And then I think it was just immediately after that, just not very long after that, uh, Jimmy Swaggart, uh, you know, just exploded. And uh, I... uh, I got an opportunity to talk to one of the men that was uh, leaders in our Assembly of God movement, and basically, um, you know, he was in a staff meeting, and basically he said this. He said, uh, as far as it is with Swagger, he said one of the things that has really uh, been on my heart is that I should have prayed for him more. I mean, he was humbly admitting that he had forfeited opportunity to pray for Swaggart. And I just, I'm curious. I mean, I wonder if enough people were praying for him if it hadn't, if it wouldn't have turned out like it had turned out. Because you realize he was supporting literally hundreds of missionaries. His ministry, worldwide ministry, was keeping hundreds of missionaries on the field. And whenever that ministry exploded, hundreds of missionaries were instantaneously not supported and they had to come home. You know, it's Missionary works all over the place. And so the Apostle Paul especially appreciated the prayers of the Philippian church. Obviously, they were a very beloved congregation to him. But the Apostle knew, as it says in James 5.16, the effective prayer of a righteous man. 
can accomplish much. So the Apostle Paul was one who diligently prayed himself, but one of the things he continually did was encourage other believers to pray diligently. A um, couple of times that you see it through his letters, uh, whenever the Apostle Paul was facing uh, some real difficult circumstances a few years earlier than whenever the letter was written to the Philippians, he appealed to the church in Corinth, in, in Corinth to pray for him. Um, Paul, uh, before Paul visited the church in Rome, this is what he told the believers. This is Roman 15, Romans 15, 30. It says, Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Listen to what Paul's saying there. I, I need you to pray for me. Um, uh, during that same imprisonment, whenever he wrote Philippians, he also admonished the Ephesians this. This is Ephesians 6, 18 and 19. He says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf. So the Apostle Paul, he's always encouraging. He's praying himself, but he's encouraging other people to pray. In, in, uh, to the Thessalonians, this is what he wrote. He said, brethren, pray for us. Uh, that's 1 Thessalonians 5.25, but also in, first, in 2 Thessalonians 3.1, it says, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will be spread rapidly and be glorified just as, I, just as it did also with you. Nothing is more encouraging to those in ministry than to know that fellow believers are holding them up before the Lord in prayer. I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm not, you know, I covet your prayers, and I know that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a delicate word, but I covet the prayers of the saints. I covet the prayers of the saints. So third thing is this. Not only did he have confidence in the prayers of the saints, confident in the uh, precepts of the Lord, but he had also confidence um, in the way that the Spirit of God was going to supply for him. How many of you all know that the job of the Holy Spirit here on this earth you know, he's got his sleeves rolled up. He's the workman, if you would, of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit, I'm sure, has got a little bit of sweat rag every once in a while, especially whenever he works with me, uh, because he's got a big job there. Amen? So the Holy Spirit's job is to bring on earth all that the church of Jesus Christ needs to make his kingdom grow. And man, that's, you know, we could get into this and preach 48 sermons on this. But that's what the Holy Spirit's job is, is to bring about the kingdom of God on this earth. So the word of God, the prayers of the saints, and the power of the Holy Spirit always work together for the benefit of the servants of God. Because you see, provision has to be given to the church of Jesus Christ in order for the church to be expanding. So look at this word provision for a minute. It says, and the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ. That word there in the Greek literally describes a, a full or a bountifully or a sufficient supply of what is needed. And immediately what I think of is whenever I think of full or bountiful, sufficient supply is pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Amen? I believe that is the heartbeat of the Spirit of God. And so the Apostle Paul says, hey, I know this. I know this is going to happen. I know because the Word of God. I know because I got people praying for me. I got people praying for me. And I'll tell you something else. The Holy Spirit is my source. He is, he is going to bring me sufficient resource so that I can get through this. Everything I need, the Spirit of God is going to supply it for me. Um, the Holy Spirit, and just very quickly, I'm going to go over these. I mean, man, I could have spent hours on these. But he provides guidance for us. I mean, the Holy Spirit wants to order our steps. Amen? The steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. So he's going to provide guidance for us. He's going to supply guidance in everything that we do. I had a gentleman in our church in uh, Montana. Cody can remember this. He had, he had a, a beard, and he would come to church, and he would have these little 
rubber bands on his beard that were different colors, you know, kind of making little ponytails of his beard. But he also had a ponytail coming out the back of his head, and he had these rubber bands on there. And so one day we're standing out. It's a beautiful day in Montana, 35 below zero, snowing. No, it wasn't. It was, I think it was during the summer. But we were standing outside kind of conversation after a Wednesday night service. And I looked at him, and I said, hey, I said, how do you choose the rubber bands in your hair? I said, what, you know, how do you pick the colors? Because they were real bright colors and lots of rubber bands. And he goes, I just asked the Lord, you know, what color I should wear today. And I just went, oh, well, that's funny. And he goes, no. He said, I really asked the Lord what color I should wear. And I went, I knew that. Of course. I asked him what color I should wear too, but I don't have a pony. You know, the Holy Spirit wants to guide us in everything we do. Everything. The Spirit also helps us pray. I mean, man, I could have given you a bunch of scriptures here. The Holy Spirit is our source of power. The Holy Spirit produces in a believer's life an abundant harvest of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience. You know, that's, and I'm just getting started here. But so the Apostle Paul, he goes, guys, he said, hey, I know this. I, I know, listen to me. I know it. I know it. The word of God. I'm telling you the prayers of the saint. I'm telling you the supply of the Holy Spirit. I'm confident. I'm confident of this. Amen. So we, we see Paul in a different light through this. Man, I mean, Paul knew it. He knew it. He knew he was going to be okay through this, if you would. So there's one more that I want to talk about. That's Philippians 1.20. It says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but... That with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. So the Apostle Paul had a real confidence in the promise of Jesus Christ. The idea is that Paul's earnest expectation, his earnest hope, were grounded in the Lord's promise, not in the Apostle's Wishful thinking. Earnest expectation is a compound word that literally refers to the stretching of the neck. Not like that. Earnest expectation. You ever stretch your neck in earnest expectation? Do I see him coming? Yeah. Anybody besides me ever do that? I mean, man, that's kids. They're the ones that are good at that, aren't they? You know, are they coming? I see it. I see it. It's coming. That's what it's talking about there. So Paul has this earnest expectation, this earnest hope. Um, it's this eager um, longing, this expectancy. But he also reinforces this earnest expectation with this, the synonym of that, which is hope. This earnest hope. He could have just said that. But he said, man, I've got an earnest expectation and I have an earnest hope. Paul was certain that in the eyes of God, he would never, ever truly be put to shame. Do you realize what it was going to look like if Caesar snatched him up and executed him? Y'all, I mean, that, that's not a good thing. So Paul knows that he's never going to be truly put to shame. Whether it's Caesar, whether it's those detractors, whether it's uh, um, the church, it makes no, no difference. He is ultimately going to be vindicated. How many of you all know that Paul was vindicated? <laughs> We're reading right now from a Paul that was vindicated. Amen? I mean, the church didn't go, okay, man, when you know, Paul wrote that, let's just kind of bury that somewhere because, you know, this is a bad deal. 
Jesus Christ vindicated him. Amen? I mean, he was all he said he was. He, he was all he said he was and more. Let's put it that way. So ultimately, he's going to be vindicated. The Apostle Paul uses always, always, even in tough situations, Paul would continue to be this instrument in the, in the Lord's hands that God used to exalt himself um, through Paul's obedience, through Paul's ministry, uh, through Paul's faithfulness. It was a good thing. So this next thing, the, the Apostle Paul was confident in the plan that God had for his life. He says, whether this is uh, the last of verse 20 and the first part of 21, he says, whether by life or by death, for me to live, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Man, that's a big verse. Amen? That's a big verse. We've, we've quoted that verse. We've heard sermons preached on that verse. The Apostle Paul was certain what God's plan was for him. He was certain of it. He knew it. He knew what it was. I'm just curious. Anybody have an idea why Paul knew the plan that God had for him? Anybody? We're friends. You can, you can just shout it out. Not everybody at once. Say it again. I think, I think that a whole lot of it had to deal with the close relationship that the Apostle Paul had with God. Anybody else? Yeah. Exactly. So whenever the Apostle Paul was struck down on the road to Damascus, just a few days after that, uh, I believe it was probably Ananias. I'm, this is not biblical, but Ananias took him in a little room and plugged a videotape in the videotape machine and played for Paul what was going to happen for Paul's life, primarily the suffering that he was going to uh, experience. But Paul got a look at what God was calling him to do. Uh, you know, and I mean, man, you know, all the suffering, I don't know. I, if I'd have been Paul, I'd go, mm, I'll pass, you know, because I mean, I read the list out of Corinthians, you know, how many things that he had gone through for the sake of the gospel. And the apostle Paul was still just full of joy, you know, I mean, my goodness, you know, I believe that Jesus knew the suffering he was going to go through and he still came and he died full of joy. Amen. So the apostle Paul had confidence in the plan of God. Uh, Paul was certain what God's plan was for, for, for him, whether he would continue to serve and exalt him through the life and the ministry that he was right now in the midst of, or if he would ultimately be exalted through death. Uh, either way, the Lord's will be done. The Lord's will was going to be done. His plan would be fully accomplished. And that's where, you know, listen, you know, we, we had a missionary one time came to us, and he was in a very, very, very dangerous part of the world. And, and a lot of... Uh, a lot of horrible, horrible things were happening. And I mean, he was in a dangerous place. He had his family down there with him. I mean, kids, wife, the whole nine yards. And I mean, he was in a, in a terrible situation. But uh, the Assemblies of God, four missions, they wanted him to come off the field. You know, no, you need to come. And he basically just told him this. He said, listen, he said, as long as I'm in the perfect will of God, he said, I am invincible. He said, I'm bulletproof. I'm bulletproof. He said, nobody can take my life. He said, Nobody take my life. Nobody can. And he went right back down into that place. And I mean, finally, the country and all the things settled down. And, but he ministered right through it. You know, him and his family. You know, you just go. <laughs> I think that's what the Apostle Paul had. He said, man, he said, if I'm done here on this earth, God is going to, he's going to validate me through death. But if I'm not through, he's going to validate me through the life I'm living. That's, you know, he just had this, you know, because remember how he started this? He said, I know this. I know this. I know this. Either way, God's plan was going to be fulfilled. Uh, to, the, to the elders in Ephesus uh, who met the Apostle Paul, this is one of the things that Paul declared, and he declared it unequivocally. This is Acts chapter 20, verse 24. 
He says, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. So this is what the Apostle Paul said, man, I, I'm, my life is nothing. My, I, I, don't, I don't hold anything in my life dear so that I may finish this course. So um, later on, uh, the Apostle Paul says this uh, to the believers in Caesarea. Um, he says, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem, die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there was a prophecy that came forth about his impending arrest. And it was a true, pro uh, you know, true prophecy. Well, they all should be true. But you all understand? And I mean, everybody's, oh, fine. He goes, man, shut up. I'm okay. He really didn't say shut up. He said, <laughs> That's what I tell my dog. She understands Spanish. Whenever she's barking and I don't want her to, she, she shuts up. Uh, this is what the Apostle Paul reminded the believers in Rome. This is uh, Romans 14, 7 through 9. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and give thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Whether he lived or whether he died. Y'all understand that? I mean, Paul has come to this place where he says, man, I know this for certain. I know this, whether I live or whether I die, Christ Jesus is going to be exalted. I'm going to be victorious, and Christ Jesus is going to be exalted. So the Greek phrase here, to live is Christ and to die is gain, is maybe a little bit translated wrong. It literally reads this, to live Christ, to die gain. There's no verb in there. To live Christ, to die gain. So Paul knew that living is Christ. I mean, if you really start to break that scripture down, living is Christ. That's it. Living is Christ. The Apostle Paul knew that because if you read about the rest of his life, one of the things you're going to understand is he lived Christ. That's it. He lived Christ. That's all. That's all that counted. There was nothing else that counted. To live Christ was his call, was his passion. He also knew that dying would be gain. Yeah? I mean, there are times in my life where I'm ready for God to come back and get me in the rapture or death or however he wants to. I'm just ready to go. Like Jerry Clower, you know, the guy up in the tree trying to shove the, the raccoon out, and the uh, guy starts hollering, and he says, shoot this thing, shoot this thing. And it wasn't a raccoon, it was a bobcat. The bobcat's got him, and the guy on the ground says, I can't shoot up there, I might hit you. And the guy in the tree says, just shoot up here amongst us. One of us has to have some relief, you know. And I mean, that's, that's kind of where we find ourselves every once in a while. I just need some relief, God. Just come and get me. Come and get me. So to die, I would gain. But I can't even imagine leaving my family right now. You know, my wife needs me. I hope my kids need me. My grandkids, I know they need me because, man, my kids are making a mess out of things. I'm having to straighten them out every time they come to my house. <laughs> Only kidding. Paul knew that living is Christ. He knew that dying was gain. Paul understood that wealth, I got a whole bunch of these, wealth, power, influence, possessions, prestige, social standing, good health, business, professional uh, success, all of those things 
are only transitory. They're, they're fleeting. They're passing. They're brief. They're temporary. They're short-lived. They're only momentary. He knew all of those things. I mean, at one time, Paul had all of that stuff. Y'all realize that? I mean, Paul was a very wealthy, influential guy. He, was, he had it all going for him. I mean, he, he, was, he, was, he was a mover and shaker. But he realized that all of that stuff was just, it was nothing. So he let it all go to live Christ, to die gain. To live, it wasn't for success, it wasn't for social standing, it wasn't for money or power, or possessions, it wasn't any of that. It was Christ. To live is Christ. He knew that ultimately, uh, none of this stuff made any difference. <clears throat> there are a lot of folks, I think, that would say to live Christ, to die, gain. But there's not many people that live as if that was really true. I mean, I looked at my own life and I thought, man, you know, to live Christ. And I've seen a lot of things that weren't Christ. Amen? I think all of us probably could do some examining and say, you know, am I like Paul? Because Paul just let all this stuff go. Y'all realize that? I mean, I imagine people that were high ups in the religious system went, what? Paul quit? What? Paul quit? You're, you're kidding me. No, Paul quit. You mean he just walked? You know, and that's what he did. He just literally walked away from all that he had worked his life to gain. I think once he said ah, something about all the stuff being, was it dung? <laughs> I mean, that's what he compared it with. He's... It's, it's, it's useless. Um, I think that there's few people that can actually say what Paul said. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. The apostles' very being, I think, was wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Nothing mattered. Nothing mattered. Nothing mattered but Jesus. I think the trust and the love and how he wanted to serve and how he wanted to witness. And I, I, think, I think that he was in every way devoted to Jesus. I think in every way he was dependent on Jesus Christ. And, you know, I'm not trying to make the Apostle Paul, you know, look better than he was. But I'm telling you, you know, he had some flaws, no question. But this guy was amazing. Because how many of y'all know whenever he wrote this stuff, he wasn't fudging. Is, it, is that making sense? I mean, he's you know, writing this down. He said, boy, this really sounds good. Makes you look good, too. <laughs> I mean, he was underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the Apostle Paul's not going to fudge in this thing, you know. I've often wondered about John. You know, John, he calls himself the, uh, the, the disciple that Jesus loved, you know. And I'm thinking Peter said, hey, what, did you write this? What about me? Am I chopped liver? What's the deal? But you have to remember that John was the guy that was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the book of John. And John was the one who was standing there at the foot of the cross and said, hey, John, look over there. That's your mom now. I mean, that was a big ask. Amen. So, you know, I don't know. But Jesus might have loved John in a different way, if you would. But these guys didn't fudge. That's what you know, we read through this and you go. You know, Paul, you, you're making yourself sound really good here. <laughs> Paul's only hope, his only purpose, his only reason to live was Jesus Christ. I mean, whenever he traveled, it was Jesus. Whenever he preached, it was Jesus. Whenever he was persecuted, whenever he was imprisoned, what was it? It was Jesus. Everything was Jesus. Just everything. Ultimately, the Apostle Paul, he had died for Jesus Christ. But even in his death, he gained. Amen? 
eternally he gained. Oh, man, i got to hurry. Okay. In spite of being in the flesh, in spite of being in the flesh, as long as the church was benefited. So this is Philippians 1, 22 through 26. It says, for I am to live on in the flesh. Oh, for if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you, with you all for your progress and the joy and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through the coming, through my coming to you again. Um, uh, I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this guy's first name, but his, he was a missionary named Judson. Uh, he was one of the first missionaries uh, sent out from America. Um, in the early 19th century, he and his uh, f- first wife went to India and a short while later to Burma, where he labored for nearly four decades. After 14 years, he had a handful of converts and had managed to write a Burmese write a Burmese grammar. During that time, he suffered a horrible imprisonment for a year and a half. He lost his wife and his children to disease. Like Paul, he longed to be with the Lord. But he also, like the apostle, he considered his work for Christ to be infinitely more important than his personal longings. So this guy lost his wife. He lost his kids. He's lost his health. The story doesn't go into it, but he's lost his health. Uh, he's you know, almost completely defeated. He's worked there all these years, and he just doesn't hardly have anything to show for it. He therefore prayed that God would allow him to live long enough to translate the entire Bible into Burmese and to establish a church there to, of at least 100 believers. The Lord granted that request and also allowed him to compile Burmese English, Burmese to English, and English to Burmese dictionaries, which became invaluable to the Christian workers, both foreign and Burmese, who followed him. He wrote, If I had not felt certain that every child was ordered by the infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived my accumulated sufferings. So here's a missionary that has gone through hell. And I'm just going to tell you, I have an idea. There was something in him that would have said, listen, I just want to die. I just just want to die. Because he knew. I mean, I think he probably read this in Philippians. To die is gain. But he decides to ask God to stay here. Part of the spiritual greatness is to know Christ intimately and to long to be with him. I mean, man, that's, that's one of the greatest things that you and I can feel. Amen. I want to go be with Jesus. I really do. I want to, I want to go now. I didn't know if that'd work or not, but it, that's something we feel. Amen. I mean, I hope every believer feels that way. Years ago, my senior pastor called me into his office and he goes, JD, you ever been to Israel? And I said, nope. I've been to New Mexico. And he says, he said, do you want to go to Israel? And I mean, man, my answer was yes, a hundred times. I have, I think every Christian should all want to go to Israel. I mean, seriously, it, it is, it is eye opening to the scripture. I mean, it, it makes the word come alive to you in ways that you could never do it outside of visiting Israel. It's an amazing place. But I told him, I said, yes, yes, I want to go to Israel. And he said, well, somebody in the church wants to pay your way. So if you want to go, you need to get a passport and get on the plane. And so it was a, it was the most awesome trip, but we all should want to go home, be with Jesus. Amen. But another trait of spiritual greatness is this, being totally committed to the advancement of the kingdom of God, serving Jesus Christ right here on this earth. I want to go home, but man, I want to do things for Jesus here on this earth. I want to go home but I really want to do something for Jesus Christ. So every believer, we've got this tension. We've got this pull, you know, like a tug of war. Y'all have seen a tug of war, yeah? 
People get on one side of the rope. People got on the other side of the rope, and everybody pulls with everything that's in them, except for the lazy people. They just kind of hold the rope. And Jesus, excuse me, the, the tug of war is kind of like what we feel for Jesus. We, we want to go home, but we want to stay here and serve him. Amen? It's a pool. The Apostle Paul had the same dilemma we had. He wanted to go home to die what is gain. I mean, man, but to live is Jesus, and I want to serve Jesus. I think he longed to be with the Lord. Um, what, did, what does he say? Um, uh, to live on in the flesh. He knew he would have fruitful labor. So if he's going to live on in the flesh, man, if he's going to stay here in, in this body, he's going to have fruitful labor. And that fruitful labor is going to ultimately bring glory to Jesus Christ. Uh, and again, that flesh is not talking about, you know, the, the, the seed of sinfulness. Uh, but this fruit of labor that he's talking about here, uh, this is the work of the Lord, which the Holy Spirit blesses. Think about this just for a minute. All human works are powerless to save. If you got saved, it was a work of the Holy Spirit. It was not a work of humans. Amen? It was the Spirit. Spirit of God. That's how you and I got saved. It wasn't a work. Some preacher preaching, somebody sharing the word with you, somebody sharing their testimony, although they may have been used by the Spirit, the human works are powerless to save. So the Apostle Paul here is speaking of spirit-empowered fruitful labor, if you would. Ephesians 2.10 says this. It says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk, walk in them. So Paul is in this quandary about death or life. It's, he's confessing, I don't know which one I should choose. And this word no in the Greek it's used 27 times in the New Testament. Over half of those times, it's used by the Apostle Paul. And it's, and it's telling us something that, you know, it's, it's revealing something, if you would, that was previously unknown, whether by Lord to man or from man to another man, something previously unknown. So Paul's point seems to be here that he hadn't yet decided. He says, I don't know. I don't know yet. I, haven't, I, haven't, I don't know which one to choose. I haven't decided which one to choose. Because the Lord really hasn't made it clear to me. Because see, I think if Paul knew he was going, I mean, if Paul was going home, he would have known he was going home. Amen? We had an elderly lady that we ministered to. Our kids fished in her pond quite a bit. And she was just a sweet, sweet lady. But she got up one day and confessed that she said, uh, I'm going to die this week. And she really didn't have a lot of major health problems. She had, you know, a few things, but she was up in years. And let me tell you what happened. She died that week. <laughs> she just went to bed, closed her eyes, and did not wake up. I think the Apostle Paul would have known. But he's saying here, I, got, I, I don't know what to choose because the Lord hasn't made it real clear to me yet. Wasn't sure what the Lord's will was in that matter. Uh, <clears throat> so he's got this quandary. And this is the way he answers it. He says, I'm hard-pressed from both directions. Uh, hard-pressed literally means uh, to hold together. It's often used of being hemmed in on both sides, walking through a narrow gorge, you know, and you're hemmed in on both sides, rock walls on both sides. Um, it also means um, uh, it's the same word used in Luke 8 whenever it talked about the multitude that were pressing in on Jesus. Y'all remember that? All the people were pressing in on the same word. Um, on one hand, Paul explained that he had the desire to depart. To depart means to unloose, kind of like a, a boat that's being untied from its moorings when it's ready to set sail. So Paul says... Uh, he's got this desire to be untied, to be loosed from these bonds that hold him now. Um, the word sometimes means a prisoner being freed from his bond, an animal being freed from its burden, or a military detachment breaking camp. And I left that one in there purposely. A military detachment 
breaking camp. So this is the depart part. Okay. This is what it means about depart. In 2 Corinthians 5.1, this is what the Apostle Paul says. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made of hands, eternal in heaven. So listen to this. For Christians, death is simply breaking their temporary earthly camp and moving on to their eternal home. I just thought that was good. This word depart that the Apostle Paul used is a word, a euphemism for death. Uh, so he had in mind this departure would be death. His second letter to, to Timothy a few years later, he told Timothy in Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, I'm fixing to die. It's going to happen. Uh, Philippians 1.23 um, kind of lets us know a couple of things, and I just want to just mention this quickly. Um, there are a lot of people that believe that whenever you die, that you go into what is called soul sleep. Has anybody ever heard of soul sleep, where you just die and you just are asleep until the resurrection? And uh, I just kind of think that this is a good place we can kind of look at that. Um, they believe that whenever we die, we don't immediately stand in the presence of Jesus. We just go to sleep. Just <laughs> Boy, don't you know there's a lot of snoring going on in places. But whenever believers die, they immediately depart to be with Christ. That's what Paul says. My desire to depart and be with Christ. You remember the thief on the cross? The one that was a penitent thief on the cross? What did he say? He said, he said, hey, remember me whenever you come into your glory. And what did Jesus tell him? Today. He says, today you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, do you guys remember um, uh, Peter getting all excited? Say, hey, let's build three tabernacles. Well, what was that about? Well, Moses and Elijah came down. And what did they do? They, they, they weren't soul sleeping, <laughs> okay? This transfiguration that took place, they, they weren't soul sleeping. So this, this is a believer's supreme hope. Our hope is to be with Jesus Christ throughout all eternity. And to depart to be with him is a great experience, amen? Doyle Kelly, which, you know, I've known Doyle for many, many years. I mean, goodness, I guess 40 years now I've known Doyle. And and, and I knew his brother, you know, better than Doyle, Wes Kelly, who has gone on to be with the Lord. But, you know, Doyle, man, he's in the presence of Jesus tonight, you know. I really, you know, I know Joyce is, is obviously, this is her dad. But I will tell you that, you know, that family has hope in them. That their dad is, their grandfather is, their husband is in heaven today. And he is in the presence of Jesus Christ. It's not soul sleep. Uh, Apostle Paul says, I am hard pressed from both directions, having my desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Very much better translates like supreme, the highest. It's like uh, um, a pizza supreme. No, that's bad. Okay, never mind. <laughs> just, just kidding. Very much better. So Paul is saying, hey, this is. This is, this is the best thing right here. Very much better. The highest, the supreme. Um, for believers, this ought to be something that we want. Um, we should prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 5.8. Um, we're home with the Lord. We're going to be freed from pain, sorrow, suffering, the present life. We're going to be ushered into the glorious presence of Jesus Christ. Uh, but he says to the Philippians to remain on in the flesh 
is more necessary for your sake. As long as the Lord had work for him to do on earth, the Apostle Paul wanted to do work here on earth. I mean, he, he said, man, I want to do it. Their following Jesus Christ examples would also make the Apostle Paul joyous because that's what we've been talking about for the last three weeks, that ministry made him joyous. I mean, to be able to minister to the Philippian church and all the other churches and all the other people, it just brought joy, complete joy to the Apostle Paul. To remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your, your sake. Paul would gladly postpone his heavenly blessings for the sake of continuing to serve earthly saints. I thought that was a really good line. Continuing to serve earthly saints. The apostle knew that the Philippians still needed him. And he wasn't ready to go. Paul was convinced that the church still needed his instruction. He was, in, he was convinced that it needed his leadership. And so the Apostle Paul hoped to remain and continue with the Philippians to promote their progress, to promote their joy, to promote their faith, and the list just goes on and on and on. Verse 26, it says, So that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. So that translates which when used subjective verb it introduces a purpose clause. So this is the purpose. This is why I want to stay behind. This is, this is my idea. This is why I want to stay behind. Paul wants to stay behind because the Philippian church would be the purpose of causing their proud confidence in him to abound, to abound in Christ Jesus through his coming to them again. In the Greek text, the phrase, in Jesus precedes the phrase in me. So the translation there kind of got it backwards. Proud confidence in me to abound in Jesus Christ through his coming. So the Apostle Paul really was saying in Jesus. It was Christ Jesus working in him that would cause the Philippian believers to be, have this proud confidence in the Apostle Paul. No circumstances no matter how severe, could cause Paul's joy to be squashed. Nothing could in, in any way diminish his enthusiasm for the ministry. I mean, think about it. You read through these, these verses and you go, geez, Paul was an animal. Amen? I mean, he was an animal. Remember I said earlier, he wasn't fudging when he wrote this stuff. I mean... He was, he tore it up for Jesus Christ. Nothing, absolutely nothing could keep him from, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. Listen to this. Nothing could keep him from always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Nothing could keep the Apostle Paul from that. He was an animal, man. He was an, he was an animal. And I say that with the deepest of respect. Amen? Amen. Well, folks, we got through verse 26. Praise God. I just feel like in this study, we could have just set out, embarked on this course to where I teach a lot of things that you guys all already know. Or we could dig through these scriptures and really get something out of them. And so I just made the decision. Now, I may speed up and slow down and speed up and slow down. But I really felt like these, these first few verses were really important for us to dig into them. And so there's just so much. I mean, that's why I'm saying Paul is an animal. I mean... He just, he's, he's, but you know who made him that way, right? Jesus. And the same spirit that done it in Paul can do it in us. Amen. So we don't have to sit back and go, man, I wish I was like Paul. We might say something like, I could be like Paul. I can be like this. The same Jesus that, 
The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead empowered the Apostle Paul. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you. I thank you for this word, Lord, and I just put it in your hands, God. We just got to get this, Lord. We just got to get this. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, as we go through these scriptures, that through the power of your spirit, God, you'll get them in us. And you'll convince us, Lord God, that we can be bold like Paul. We can be full of the spirit like Paul. We can be focused on all the things that Paul was focused on. And Father, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you folks. Amen.